been um, has been able to get on, but but otherwise we'll we'll just get started. So, good evening again, everyone, and and welcome to our digital connectivity framework engagement session. Um, and special thanks to to Matt Costello for organising and facilitating this and the live stream for us. So live stream, that means everyone, I just want to let you know that the event is being live streamed, so it will be available for others to, 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 to join in and watch and perhaps send messages to any of the representatives of any questions that they want to ask. So I'm Katrina Hassel, I'm Head of Business and Digital at North Lanarkshire, and I'm the Chair for this evening's activity. Again, just before we begin, can I ask everyone just to ensure that if you're not speaking or presenting, that you stay on mute at all times, and that just helps us to avoid any of those horrible background noises that come through and make it challenging for people to hear the presentations. So you've hopefully seen from, from the information that accompanied the meeting invite that the key purpose of tonight is to provide you with details of the connectivity framework that the Council has recently put in place with Comms World to improve the coverage and the reach of the digital networks that we have within our, our towns and villages. Um, and these are often points that have, have come up over the, the, the piece since the, the community boards have been um, in, in place, really. So we see that sort of increased coverage and reach as, as essential for increasing access to education and to training and to jobs. And very shortly, three of my colleagues will outline the, the possibilities and the opportunities that we hope we will be able to take forward through that partnership with Comms World. So format of tonight, we're, we're scheduled to run until 8 p.m. and I've got a panel of people available to hear your thoughts on how best to use that new infrastructure to support you and the communities that you represent to become more digitally active and more digitally confident. On the panel, I'll, I'll introduce everyone shortly. We were due to have the Council's Chief Executive, Des Murray, um, speaking to us, but he's unfortunately lost his voice, so he isn't able to join us and speak to you about the plan and, and the vision for North Lanarkshire. Our Deputy Chief Exec, Derek Brown, has thankfully and kindly um, agreed to, to cover Des' slot, uh, so, so thanks to you, Derek, um, in advance uh, for, for doing that. If it's okay with you, I'll bring you in the end of the panel introductions, uh, because that then allows you to lead nicely into the, the presentation that Grant and Yvonne are going to cover off on the, the digital connectivity framework. And again, that will lead nicely into the, the question and an answer session that we've got for the panel towards the end. So on to the panel then. We've got a couple of representatives with us from Combs World um, and a few officers from the council. So, starting with yourself, Bruce, um, can I invite each panel member to come off mute um, and to take 30 seconds or so just to come in, um, introduce yourselves, let people see you, and just say a little bit about the role that you have on this, um, what we consider to be an exciting uh, development opportunity. Um, yep. If you come in, please, Thank you. Bruce. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Bruce Strang. I'm Chief Operating Officer from Comms World. Um, I've been involved with this since um, the very early days, and um, I'm, I'm the executive sponsor within Comms World to, to make sure that we deliver what we say we're going to do, but also work closely with um, Grant and the team within North Lanarkshire to deliver um, not just the connectivity for the, the, um, the council sites and schools, but also how we enable that digital connectivity across the North Lanarkshire region. Um, and you know the, the project itself is well underway, and um, this this is really to start talking about the art of the possible. The infrastructure will be there. Um, I'll try not to steal too much of the presentation, but the infrastructure will be there, and that will allow um, many things to be done as part of that. Um, so that, that's who I am. I'm the executive sponsor from Comms World. Thanks very much, Bruce. Um, Caroline, can I invite you to come in as well, please? Thank you, Katrina. Hi, everyone. Caroline Miller, also from Comms World, also been involved from the start of the development of this, and I have been working with the internal teams within North Lanarkshire to develop the community benefits. I think I may have seen some of the people that are in the audience tonight um, at some of the workshops that we've had. 
um, and I'm working closely with Yvonne on um, the delivery of the community benefits and making sure that we bring the right things to North Lanarkshire. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Grant, can I invite you to come in um, and then if you just hand straight on to Yvonne, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Grant Reid. I'm the, uh, the Technology Strategy Manager here at North Lanarkshire. Uh, I've been involved in this since its kind of concept uh, uh, quite a while now. We've been we're going through this, working with a bond, uh, trying to kind of work up the business case for why we would do this, what did we think we were going to get out of a market engagement, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So it's a long, long procurement journey to get here, and it's, it's really good to start seeing the, the fibre actually been pulled through and services getting close to getting pulled on. Uh, so I'll just quickly pass over to Yvonne. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Yvonne Weir and I'm Enterprise Manager with North Lanarkshire Council. So as Grant said, I've been involved since the outset of the project, looking at the business case and looking at how we can maximise the benefits of the procurement um, for our local residents, businesses and communities. So I'm working with Caroline and Grant, just leading on the added value aspects of the contract and also the community benefits. Thank you. Yeah, thanks to you both. Um, Linda, can I invite you in and then if you just hand to Jennifer, please. Thank you, Katrina. Good evening, everybody. I'm Linda Johnston. I'm the Business Strategy Manager at North Lanarkshire Council, and I have responsibility both for the Council's governance, policy, strategic planning and um, performance arrangements, as well as those of the Community Planning Partnership. And the work that Yvonne outlined around community benefits with Caroline, I'll be responsible for making sure the monitoring and management framework is in place for that and that we have responsibility for reporting back on progress to our communities. And I'll hand over to Jennifer. Thank you, Linda. Hello, everybody. My name is Jennifer Lees and I'm Business Partnership Manager with North Lanarkshire Council. And although I was originally involved in the early development of the connectivity contract, my main reason for being here tonight is um, because of the work that I do supporting North Lanarkshire Community Planning Partnership. And tonight's session is one of the first in a series of engagement events that we're planning with community board members over this year. Um, so you'll, if you come along to the subsequent sessions that we've got on the local police plan, for example, you'll see me at that as well. Back to you, Katrina. Thanks, Jennifer. So thanks to everyone for introducing themselves. So last but very not least, um, can I bring you in now, Derek, introduce yourselves and then just move on to your slot um, about the place and the vision and how the council sees this as, as a key enabler for all of that. Thank you. So, well, thank you for the introduction, Katrina. Um, as as has been said, my name is Derek Brown. I'm um, for the last two months, I've been deputy chief executive of North Lanarkshire Council, and I'm very proud to be a uh, deputy chief executive of North Lanarkshire Council. Previously, um, and I still retain a, a an oversight of um, I was executive director for education and families, um, and I've been in North Lanarkshire, back in North Lanarkshire for four years, um, years ago, way back in 1996, I was a teacher in North Lanarkshire. So that's my, I suppose, my, my background. I've, I've dotted around Scotland and come back um, and I'm delighted to be back. So um, and tonight I have the added uh, privilege of being Des, Des Murray's lost voice. All right, because Des obviously can't be here. He's lost his voice. So I get to step in for Des and be his voice for the evening, which has a curious pressure to it because I want to try and live up to his expectations and I know how passionate and how visionary uh, Dizzy's work has been in the digital field working with Katrina and others and Grant etc and Vaughan etc. Um, so I'm going to try and do justice to that vision um, and as Jennifer has said this is a first of a series of uh, sessions relating to the strategic planning for the plan for North Lanarkshire for the partnership which invites all community boards to come. So there'll be a number of these. And I suppose we're focusing on digital because it's a priority across the town boards within the different LOIPs, but also a key driver across the whole of the North Lanarkshire Partnership. And I'm using that word partnership because this is not just about the council, it's about the wider area and how we can bring everybody on board with us in a strategic approach that really makes a difference. 
Um, and it's great to hear rep have representatives here tonight from across all of the towns in North Lanarkshire. And we really do hope you enjoy the session. And I think you will learn a lot. I think you will really benefit from it. And I hope you ask lots of questions because I think the team will be delighted to be able to field them. I suppose the first big point I want to make is, and this is very much a direct quote, Des Murray said, whatever you say, make sure you say this first, right? Because this is really important to us. Digital, digital access connectivity should be seen as an essential human right in the 21st century. It's the first thing. Everyone should have connectivity. Everyone should have an access mechanism. And through that connectivity, we can engineer transformations in things like education and health and employment and the economy more widely. To do that, we must tackle the hard problems. And the hard problems around connectivity relate to those who are hardest to reach and to bring on to the digital world, I guess. And to do that, we need an effective partnership with the private sector. So we have designed with the market a contract that's unique in the UK, uh, which was with Con uh, Comms World, which will deliver that connectivity over time. And I'm really looking forward to hearing um, what Grant and Yvonne and Jennifer have to say about that. And I'm sure you will as well. It will bring digital learning to the doorstep of, of children and families, but it's not just about education. It doesn't stop there. And it really is about um, helping our most hard to reach individuals, our most hard to reach communities. Um, and that can be due to various things, vulnerability, rurality, uh, economic deprivation, all sorts of things can make it more, age can make it more difficult to engage with the digital um, world. The strategy cannot just be about those with the ability to pay. And it cannot therefore just be left to market forces. So our public private sector partnership with Comms World is that unique arrangement that brings the best of what the private sector can offer, the best of local authority planning, and can allow a genuine strategic approach to take place across all the towns and villages of North Lanarkshire. We have this ambition. Um, and we're in the final stages of trying to plan to, to bring it. And again, this is one of the things Des really wants me to stress is really important to him. And this is particularly important given his housing background. But ideally, the ambition would be to bring free connectivity to all 40,000 of our social homes, which would be absolutely massive. And we'd like to be the first local authority that cracks that. So that's a huge ambition. It affects all areas of North Lanarkshire. And we also believe if we're able to do that, that we would allow private partners to tap into that connectivity and offer services. And we hope also private householders would be able to benefit from the um, knock-on benefits of those things as well. So I'm really proud of what you're going to hear tonight because you're going to hear some from really, really interesting, um, able people who have got some fantastic vision for what they want to do. I'm really proud of their unique arrangement and so is the Chief Executive that we have with Comms World. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the team share their plans that will impact on your communities and on North Lanarkshire as a whole. And with that, I think, Katrina, I'm going to pass over to Grant, Yvonne and Jennifer for their session. Absolutely. Um, if you just start to load up the presentation, Grant and Yvonne, that would be appreciated. So thanks very much, Derek, for providing that context in the background. Um, I, I'm really highlighting why um, the, the detail that you're about to see is, is so important to the, to the Council. So, fingers crossed, everyone, that this presentation runs smoothly across the WebEx platform. Um, if I could just ask that as Grant's going through it, that if you've got any questions, that you drop them on the chat, and then pick them up at the end, and we'll cover them off in the, with the panel session and the panel that you've just made. Over to you, Grant. Thank you, Katrina. I'm going to kick off. Um, so back in February 2022, the Council awarded a connectivity framework contract to Comms World to support the Council to improve connectivity for our own buildings and our residents, communities and businesses. We're going to talk through why we awarded this contract and to give you a flavour of some of the many benefits it will bring to the Council and more importantly to our residents, communities and businesses as we move forward in an increasingly digital world. 
Due to the high levels of deprivation and distributed nature of some of our eight towns and smaller villages and settlements, North Lanarkshire is not as commercially attractive as a city or other more densely populated areas who tend to be prioritised for digital investment first. To address this, we sought to disrupt the market and accelerate the rollout of fibre infrastructure through our contract to enable connectivity opportunities to be delivered faster than if left to normal market rollout and forces. So North Lanarkshire Council has always been clear in its ambition to be a leading digital authority, but this vision has always been wider than just digitisation of council services and has looked at how we can create a truly competitive digital economy in place for our residents, communities and businesses. We've been bold in our vision. We've sought to maximise the benefits of the council's investment in its own digital infrastructure and connectivity to enable that investment to be a key driver to stimulate economic growth, tackle areas of digital exclusion, improve choice and affordability and deliver on each of the plan for North Lanarkshire's live, learn, work, invest and visit strands. Through our own investment and in connectivity, through our framework contract with Commsworld, we're enabling the accelerated rollout of a world-class digital infrastructure across North Lanarkshire, which is seeking to provide gigabit capable fibre broadband connectivity to every home and business across North Lanarkshire, whether they are in remote and rural communities or low-income households and more densely populated areas. From town centres to business parks and our more rurally located communities, we see universal connectivity as a key enabler in delivering our shared ambition of inclusive growth and prosperity for all. Our investment in digital infrastructure aims to benefit North Lanarkshire's people equally, enable workers and businesses to be more productive, optimise the experience of visitors, attract business investment and support our staff to deliver crucial services efficiently and effectively while supporting new, flexible, agile working practices and a shift to online delivery models. The investment will also ensure that North Lanarkshire's digital infrastructure is not only future-proof, Internet of Things capable and 5G ready, but crucially capable of improving the quality of life of our residential and business users through investment in technology that will lead to smart and sustainable outcomes. But what would have happened if we'd not taken this bold and ambitious move? If we'd not moved forward with plans to improve our own and wider connectivity, the market would eventually deliver fibre broadband to some areas of North Lanarkshire, as illustrated through the publicised rollout plans from OpenReach up to 2026. Without our accelerated intervention, our residents, businesses and economy would lag behind other areas of Scotland, the UK and beyond. Currently, only 8% of residential and commercial properties in North Lanarkshire have access to full fibre broadband, and that was sourced from the Ofcom report in Connected Nation in 2019. So Commsworld is investing in a new purpose-built, infinitely scalable, ultra-fast fibre backbone network across all key conurbations of North Lanarkshire. Along with OpenReach's published plans, Commsworld's initial commitment to the Council is to enhance fibre coverage across North Lanarkshire to over 85% to support the Council to achieve its target of 100% fibre coverage. This involves the building of 340 kilometres of high capacity fibre to link the Council's estate, which will pass 101,752 properties within 200 metres. This will be achieved by June 2023. Commsworld is also working with its partners who have committed the following. By January 2023, Axion will deliver gigabit speed services to residents and businesses of over 5,000 properties and shops. By December 2024, NetOmnia will deliver gigabit speed services to residents and businesses of 86,651 properties in Motherwell, Coatbridge and Airdrie. And by December 2024, NVT and Almacom will deliver services to a minimum of 1,000 rural properties across North Lanarkshire, maximising the use of government vouchers for these properties. Commsworld will also deliver fibre to all 29 parks in North Lanarkshire for future use cases and enable connection to each of the main business parks in North Lanarkshire. To enhance the case and to encourage further investment to strive towards achieving 100% fibre fiber coverage over and above the 85% commitment, Commsworld will offer its new fibre backbone to all service providers at a market leading price. Commsworld is already engaging with its partners on this and the measure of properties passed and properties taking up services will continue to be a contract target they will be assessed on. I'll now hand over to Grant. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, just checking you can hear me yet, yeah, making sure the mute was working there. Thank you very much. Uh, so, how do Commsworld intend in delivering this infrastructure and how can they achieve it by June 23? 340 kilometres of fibre install is a massive task. 
and is unachievable using the traditional methods of picking up the streets. Fortunately, Comms World are licensed to use existing open reach infrastructure. This means that they can reuse existing open reach docks and poles. Open reach exchanges have been used by the new wave of suppliers such as Talk uh, Sky and Talk Talk, etc., from December 2000 to house their services to anyone who has these providers. This is how they deliver services. They lease the cables from open reach and lease space for their equipment within exchanges. But importantly, this means it's reusing the existing provision of copper cables or fibre if your street is lucky enough to be covered. So what does reusing open reach infrastructure mean? Well, rather than reusing the cables, it allows suppliers to install their own sub ducts within open reach ducts, through which they blow fibre or attach equipment directly to open reach poles. Just waiting for the slides to catch up. Uh, so there you'll see a, a, a chamber next to an existing BT chamber. Commonwealth estimate that 85% of the fibre install can be achieved via this method, removing the need for some 290 kilometres of road and pathway openings. So now we'll talk about broadband vouchers and the anchor tenant model. The anchor tenant model sees the council as being the anchor that provides guaranteed stability for a supplier encouraging them to invest in areas that commonly generate a lower financial return and hence tend to be served later or never at all. Council schools and corporate premises will all be served by fibre as part of this contract, acting as that anchor. A key focus of this procurement was how we could ensure that through our commitment, suppliers would expand into those less financially rewarding and often more expensive areas to serve. North Lanarkshire has some 3,000 properties that fall into that category. Individuals and businesses can apply for voucher funding via the Scottish Broadband Voucher Scheme, and that can provide up to £5,000 per site to help businesses and homes not in scope planned commercial investments to obtain superfast broadband. Although the Council itself may not need broadband at these locations, it's to our benefit and the benefit of our residents and local businesses that they do. Therefore, Commons World are required to establish a focus programme on delivering to these rural properties. They will aid residents and businesses to apply for vouchers and look to create aggregated voucher capacity to provide connectivity into small hamlets and groups of properties, particularly important for serving farming communities previously poorly served. They will do this via mail drops, door knocking, ongoing engagement with our community boards. Voucher take up is one of our measurable performance criteria that Comms World will be monitored on. So opportunities. So far we've talked about the why and the how, physically uh, what this looks like, but beyond fibre into our premises and improved fibre footprint, what are we actually getting from this service? That could be summarised in a lot more capacity and a consolidated public Wi-Fi service. All high schools will see their network connectivity increase fivefold to five gigabit. Also delivered resiliently, that means two diversely routed services into each high school, so that it can maximise availability and uptime. Each non-secondary educational establishment will receive a twentyfold increase providing one gigabit of connectivity. The hope here is this aids the enablement, development and creativity of digital learning. Traditional corporate buildings, including culture and leisure, will see expansion of capacity with services from one to 10 gigabit being installed. The council had previously operated a number of separate public Wi-Fi services across town centres, leisure and cultural sites. However, these, are all required, these all require an individual to join each separately and provide limited business information for the bodies concerned. This new offering will continue to be delivered as free uh, public Wi-Fi as a service over the new infrastructure, which means we can turn it on at any site. We are also expanding this consolidated service out into country parks, sheltered housing, supported accommodation properties and high schools, providing the opportunity for everyone with a device to be online and interact freely with council services, digital learning, standard web browsing and social media. In addition to the services listed, we are starting to blend in CCTV connectivity within this contract 
and have the ability to deliver CCTV connectivity as a service to every site on the network, which allows our colleagues in community safety to deploy CCTV camera technology. Crucially, if we're going to maximise the opportunities that the fibre connectivity will bring, we need to ensure our young people, residents, communities and businesses have the digital skills and capabilities they need to use and access services, access education, learning and skills, access employment opportunities, have the ability to upskill or reskill in digital areas, and for businesses to have skills and expertise to adopt digital technologies to drive forward productivity and growth. We have already seen the fantastic learning experiences that have been put in place through our digital schools and educational curricula. In particular, the immersive classroom experience on the screen now, available at Muirfield Centre, which offers a unique and scalable digital learning experience, which we are looking to replicate at other sites across North Lanarkshire and widen out the uh, community access to these facilities. We are finalising an ambitious Digital Skills Academy model and plans linked to our Workforce for the Future strategy and are driving digital locally activities to improve access to digital skills, which was a priority identified in seven of the nine local outcome improvement plans. In doing so, we aim to ensure that no one is left behind digitally and that we create digital pathways which are linked to current and future business needs for our young people and those seeking employment or those seeking to upskill or reskill. A recent business survey highlighted 67% of North Lanarkshire businesses currently have a digital skills gap. This is a worrying figure. We will work with businesses to further understand and address the digital skills gap through our digital skills plan. We are already working with businesses to harness the opportunities that enhanced connectivity, enhanced connectivity can bring. Our Robotic and Automation Centre of Excellence at Smart Hub Lanarkshire, delivered in partnership with University of Strathclyde and New College Lanarkshire, is breaking new grounds in supporting digital businesses to explore the opportunity that digital can bring. Our young people are also going to benefit from our school's engagement programme with the Smart Hub and to be able to get hands on with the robots. As part of their added value and community benefits offering, Comms World and their partners, including Young Enterprise Scotland and Smart Stems, will work with our schools, employability services, residents, businesses and communities to support digital skills and assist the Council to address digital exclusion. And I'll pass you back to Yvonne. Thanks, Grant. So the next section of the presentation is about the art of the possible. How can we use technology and the enhanced connectivity to improve our communities? Everything that's mentioned here, however, is real and used somewhere in the world. Starting with a smart town, what does that mean? Well, for instance, using the infrastructure to aid a smarter transport system. This could include smart bus stops, real-time bus schedules, smart parking apps, reactive smart traffic management responding to conditions, locations and tracking of community cycles, smart and safe green travel routes. A smart system looks to move people and goods efficiently, reduce vehicle volume, reduce pollution and make movement safer. If our infrastructure is smarter, this can create opportunity for proactive maintenance and services, improved reactive maintenance, but also adjustment to environmental conditions and situations. Lighting that adjusts to conditions, roads that tell us when ice conditions are likely, rainwater gullies that are blocked or overflowing, potholes forming in our roads, information on frequently used pathways, benches and green space, and don't forget the bin that tells you it needs emptied. The public, of course, are our eyes and ears and tell us when they don't like our services or something is broken, but can we make this easier and more efficient to do so? QR codes on our infrastructure, for example, would allow simple reporting of issues, but also improve digital interaction. Public Wi-Fi will help, but perhaps an expanded public access computing model, kiosks or tablets and sports centres in schools could facilitate that interaction. A thing that COVID reminded us of was the need to impart information and guidance to the public. Can we use our infrastructure to support displays that allow us to push out messaging? Should we have these in town centres, parks and other spaces? Can we enhance the customer experience in our public use areas? For example, the use of virtual reality via your smartphone to see how the Antonine Wall or the Roman bathhouse in Strathclyde Park may have looked. Fibre connectivity brings a range of benefits to the home as well that can reduce digital exclusion. It offers reliable bandwidth and high speeds to residents in those properties, enabling access to the internet, council services, and a range of platforms, including education, health and care, welfare advice, and skills and employment. Importantly, the fibre connectivity can also able, enable the rapid deployment of what is known as the Internet of Things to properties. 
Accelerating the adoption of smart sensors within homes could ultimately result in savings for both the resident and the council. Sensors are rapidly evolving as technology advances and can include, for example, damp sensors, heat sensors, carbon dioxide sensors, boiler sensors, as well as fire sensors and a range of remote telemedicine and other healthcare solutions. The data and insights generated and gathered from the sensors can inform strategic planning of property, utilities, maintenance and construction, enabling the health effects of the indoor environment to be quantified and to help make informed recommendations to benefit both the council and the tenant. Proactive engagement by both maintenance teams and property residents can reduce costs while improving living conditions, health and lifestyles. The improved data analytics from sensors and usage can ultimately drive more tailored council services. In particular, the Council's enhanced digital connectivity provision has the potential to provide huge opportunities to use smart technology to support the delivery of health and social care services and the delivery of assisted living to our residents. Through the fibre rollout, there are considerable opportunities for the installation of enhanced smart technology, remote telemedicine and healthcare solutions to support assisted living in both our residents' properties and our sheltered housing provision to create a flexible and adaptable wellbeing ecosystem across North Lanarkshire. Assisted living technology and its applications can work with individuals, carers, health and care professionals and families to extend independence, improve quality of life, help com combat isolation and loneliness, increase a sense of safety and security, join up services and provide real time data and alerts. As technology advances, it's becoming increasingly easy to install and use with an increased ability to predict movements and user needs. So I hope um, that this overview that Grant and I have given has given you a good overview of what the fibre connectivity will bring to North Lanarkshire and the potential future uses and the art of the possible. I'm now going to hand over to Jennifer Lees, who will give you an update on driving digital locally activities. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Thanks, Grant. Um, Good evening again, and my colleague Lynn Gow um, leads on the drive in digital locally work. And Lynn has been at the Royal Garden Party in Edinburgh this afternoon and couldn't guarantee getting back out from Holyrood and across here in time for the meeting this evening. Um, if she is back in time, she'll certainly join us. But I'm happy to give this update on drive in digital locally on Lynn's behalf. And if there are questions about our work um, with communities on the digital agenda, I'll certainly try and answer those in Lynn's absence. And if I can't, please be assured that we will take a note of them, pass them on to Lynn and come back to you. So what does driving digital locally mean? It means exactly what it says on the tin. To support the digital transformation that Grant and Yvonne have outlined, we want to put local communities at the very heart of that transformation. It's about supporting you to become digitally confident and capable, but we know that not um, one size doesn't fit all and every community is at different stages on that digital journey. And we work with the individual nine community boards across North Lanarkshire to help you identify your digital needs and also those of your community, whether that be older people, young people with families, people looking to get into the digital and technology sector for work. Digital inclusion is a priority for all board areas. And by digital inclusion, we mean Having the confidence and skills that I spoke about, but also not being excluded in the way that Derek described in the introduction, not being excluded from digital technology through living in a rural or poorly served area or not being able to afford a monthly broadband subscription and package fee. In our work, we do want to avoid duplication because there's already a lot of really good work going on across North Lanarkshire around digital inclusion. By building those capable and confident communities, we can make sure that your families can take advantage of exciting new job opportunities in the technology sector and also ensure that your children and young people are able to participate fully in digital learning um, in school and at college. So through the digital local 
Bentley subgroup, we've already started to deliver some real and tangible benefits. And if I can ask Grant just to move me on to the next slide, I'll talk you through some of those. In the first instance, we set up the digital subgroup last year and we've got reps from all nine community boards on that subgroup. The aim of the group is to maximise the use of digital services for communities across North Lanarkshire. The initial meeting of the subgroup took place last August and um, I'm delighted to say that we've got a chair and a vice chair who are both really enthusiastic and committed to the digital agenda and they've both just been re-elected for another year so that gives us some um, continuity and longevity in taking forward the work with the local people around digital. The group's got terms of reference in place and approved, and they're also now starting to work productively and to deliver some real outcomes. So the first of those outcomes and early, early successes, using money from um, Connecting Scotland and the Flexible Digital Fund, we're able to um, access devices, laptops, and also connectivity solutions, um, little log on fobs that allow people who otherwise wouldn't have access to digital connectivity to get online and to begin to use um, online services. And group members have reported that they wouldn't have been able to do that. They wouldn't have had the confidence to do that if it wasn't from the support that they got from the digital subgroup. One of our most exciting developments is with residents in sheltered housing complexes. And again, using Scottish Government funding through Connecting Scotland, we were able to secure 200 devices for those elderly people. And this was in the heart of the, the pandemic when it was at its worst and many elderly people were isolated and separated from their families and their friends. And we identified 25 digital champions within the council, staff members who volunteered to get involved and befriend and buddy up with those elderly residents and show them how to log on, how to create a password and how to use their, their laptop to have a chat with their friends or family over um, a Zoom call, how to access their banking online, how to order their prescription or order their messages online. And that initiative is just going from strength to strength and it's helped to combat feelings of isolation and loneliness that those elderly residents would otherwise have experienced. And it's also had a really positive impact on their health and their mental well-being. We're also undertaking a digital mapping exercise. And one of the key priorities that the digital subgroup agreed was to gain a better understanding of what digital provision and training exists across North Lanarkshire. And the group carried out a mapping exercise and created a short survey targeted at local, voluntary and public sector organisations who are delivering digital training and services. And this will allow us to identify what training's already being provided? Because I did say at the start, there is a lot of good work already underway and we don't want to duplicate or replicate that. But importantly, it'll allow us to identify where there are gaps in access to digital training and in working with the community boards to plug those gaps. We're also taking the results from that survey work and layering them across North Lanarkshire to give us an accurate provision of where there is good training and provision or where we've maybe got gaps in service and a, a bit of a, a desert in terms of digital access and training. More recently, the subgroup has been involved in supporting the community boards in developing the digital, the, the development programme for community board members. And some of you will have completed the training needs analysis that was done to identify what your training or development needs are as a community board member. And 
members of the digital subgroup have user tested the learning platform that's been established and offered valuable feedback to help make that development online learning program more responsive to your needs and um, structured to better meet your training needs. The nine, across the nine community boards, seven of them, I specifically identified digital inclusion as a priority in the local outcome improvement plans. And it's really important that we work with the community boards to ensure that um, local people are not excluded or are, don't have the opportunity to get in, become involved. And to support this work, the digital um, Driving Digital Locally group has worked directly with the Access NL panel, with youth forums, with adult learner forums, with older people to look at what your digital um, requirements may be. We're inviting everyone from the community boards to get involved and help us in this work to ensure that our communities are indeed digitally confident, capable and connected. And if you would like to hear any more about the work of the subgroup or if you've got any specific questions or if you want to get involved, please don't hesitate to get in touch with Lynn and her details are on that final slide there. And also I've noticed in the chat a couple of people asking if we will be sharing these slides and yes, we will um, after the meeting. So you will have access to Lynn's email address there. Thanks very much indeed for listening folks and I'll hand back to Katrina now. Thanks very much, uh, Derek, Grant, Yvonne and Jennifer, um, for just for providing that context and, and running through the presentation um, and outlining, I guess, the, the opportunities. Um, if I could, there was a lot in there um, and, and I know that my colleagues tried not to be overly technical, but while still trying to give you the context of, of the change that's coming over the next 12 to 18 months. So if I could summarise first, you know, we saw the maps um, that highlighted where we're going to be expanding that reach and coverage, and, and hopefully you found that useful. Um, hopefully you also got some assurances that there won't be um, much digging up of roads and pavements, which I know often causes our, our residents and our businesses concern. Um, hopefully you can start to see the scope for facilitating affordable access, and, and we're starting to see some questions coming through in the chat about that. Um, but most importantly, well, one of the reasons we wanted to leave um, a, a decent amount of time um, at the end for the panel session is that we're hoping that's going to make you start to get some food for thought on opportunities and benefits that this new infrastructure can bring to the communities you represent. So I've been monitoring the chat and whilst um, everyone was working through that, Jennifer's picked up already about the, the presentation. Um, we had four questions up to the point I started speaking, so I'll pick up on any others um, as we're going through. So the, the first question that I'm going to pose to the panel came from Sham Bissett. Initially, Sham's comment was about, is public Wi-Fi safe? Um, but when I responded, the actual question is, well, how will it be safe from hackers? So can I hand that to you initially, Grant, um, and possibly Bruce as well, just to explain, um, I guess, the actions that we take to make sure our public Wi-Fi is safe, although recognising that, that cyber security is, is a major issue now, Grant. Yeah, give, give me a nice easy one to start with. Thanks very much. Uh, so the, 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 the technology that we tend to use there is, is inherently secure. The back end of it is secure. Uh, we can uh, attach things into that environment that make sure that we are monitored to make sure that people aren't putting in a, a kind of false wireless access points that make you join or trying to steal some of your information as well. So it's it you know public Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi in general is inherently an awful lot more secure than what it used to be. The encryption levels that we use on this are are, are, are very high as well. Uh, the, we will be using a cloud-based solution, so that's from a third-party supplier that Bruce can tell us a wee bit more about, that you will log into, and that's delivering that as a service. And there'll be certain criteria that we'll be looking to gather from you about, you know, just to, to create that account, to connect on. 
Uh, but all of that is then that information. Uh, we, uh, the companies that we use, and Bruce has had to go through this, and the third party that he's using will have to go through as well. We go through a, a, what we call a cloud security principles assessment of any of those providers to make sure that they uh, carry out the, the, the tasks that we expect them to carry out for providing security on a frequent basis. And we assess them against that. And then we continually assess them against that on whatever frequency we determine needs to happen. So whether that be every year, we'll be back at them saying, how are we assessing yourself now? And we go through that process. And as I say, Bruce has already had to do that uh, partly for us. Uh, but we haven't done it with the, the, the public Wi-Fi provider that uh, Bruce is tied into, but we will get to that. But is there anything else you want to add to that, Bruce? Yeah, just at the the back end infrastructure, it's um, one one of our partners. They deliver services to the MOD, um, and it's public Wi-Fi services that they deliver. So the platform, as you can imagine, in the MOD environment, has to be inherently secure. Um, the other thing that you need to think about is is on your own devices. Things like if you are using it for business, you have a VPN, which effectively encrypts your traffic. So you know, th 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 there's a lot of responsibility that we can put from a public Wi-Fi perspective. But on top of that, there's also things you can do on your own devices. So for example, if it's business use, you would have a VPN which should secure your data. Even if somebody was trying to monitor traffic, that would protect you on top of the secure mechanisms in play. Thanks both. Hopefully that provides assurances that the security will be um, taken seriously. But um, anyone who's asked a question after um, we provide a response, if you want anything further, just drop it on the chat. But I want to come back to that later just to make sure that we've got um, time to cover the questions we've got. So second question then from Councillor Rob, um, and I'll pass this one straight to you, Bruce, is specifically a question around what will comms world do if when they go to start working and sharing on the ducts that they find that they are full or damaged? Yeah, so we're already underway with the programme. Um, we are slightly ahead of plan, so we've got about 40 kilometres of infrastructure already in the ground. Um, the, the point that's made in the question about um, ageing infrastructure or blockages within duct, um, we, we find that on occasions, you know, we've found a few bridges where we can't get across, we've, so we'll look for alternative routes. That's our first, first step, is we'll look for alternative routes around the network. Um, if we do have to do um, overbuild, which we try and keep to a minimum, we will build our own network, um, short short sections if there are blockages. First approach, though, is to try and unblock it um, so we can actually go into the, the, the ground, unblock the any um, problems, and then um, put the duct and subduct in on there. This question is specific to telephone exchanges. Again, around telephone exchanges, you occasionally get challenges. Typically, what we do is we take the infrastructure up to the, the outside of a, a telephone exchange, and then from there, we will build our own route into the exchange. So that last couple of hundred, hundred metres or 100 metres will actually be comms world built infrastructure into the exchange if, if, if allowed to do that so that we'll get separate. But typically exchanges, I've not found any problems so far in, in, in my time, probably at least 35 years as well doing, doing this type of job. You get, you get challenges on exchanges, but um, the, they're usually the easier part to overcome. It's bridges and structures that tend to be the bigger problems. Did hopefully that answered the question. Thanks very much, Bruce. Um, two questions then from Mark Howard. Um, the first half of the question was um, in this um, challenging times of, of cost of living increases, um, what are we doing about um, affordability? Um, and the second part was um, what kind of in-person engagement are we going to have? So on the first part, you know, I, I'll start by saying you know, that, that um, it's more crucial than ever that, that we actually start to take this forward. And as part of the presentation, Grant and Yvonne were, were, were highlighting, and Derek as well, actually, you know, that affordability is something that the Council is, is seriously considering. And, and there's dialogue underway with, with Comms World, um, as I say, that to see what, what can be done about making this um, free where possible. Um, public Wi Fi obviously will help with that um, through, as, as Grant said, you know, our, our public buildings, our, our council leisure, our parks. So we're doing what we can, really, if people do have any devices or they can go to the, the libraries and the public buildings and use the good Wi Fi that will be available there to be able to move it forward. 
but the council also has um, the, its, its, its strap lines of when it's looking at services, it looks to do universal provision, additional provision and intensive provision. Um, and, and one of the things I think that we would want to do there is, is working with the, the community groups is, is to identify any individuals that, that perhaps need um, that we need more awareness of in, in that in, intensive area, so that we, we we can try and make sure that there is that universal provision for all. Before I hand to Jennifer for the in-person engagement, which again Jennifer touched on a little bit around community boards. Derek, is there anything else that you would want to add um, as covering for days around the the, the the challenging cost of living rise and how this fits in here? Well, I think. <clears throat> Not particularly, Katrina. I, th I think all, t all I think that I would say about the community boards generally, because we've had a lot of discussion about the community boards, and I suppose um, what I, th what I'm, I would be hoping for is that the bigger strategic things that the council is trying to do, and the local priorities of the boards somehow come together as we mature the model, and the people in this call help us do that. Um, and are enabled to to lead things forward locally, and we're able to make good decisions. Um, but I, I suppose one of the things that's on my mind is that the where the strategics likely to kind of intersect with the local is around the big priorities that affect people, and cost of living is definitely one of them. There's no doubt about it. But people are struggling more and more. Um, and 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 if we can get some pretty big radical solutions, such as this this solution here in terms of uh, connectivity, I think that that could be massive for people in terms of opening up the world of kind of education and work and health as well. As I said before, so I suppose the cost of living crisis, the pressure on local government finance that will come, the backwash of of COVID and and other kind of international things that are affecting the the UK economy at the moment. And where I suppose we are in terms of um, how we'll fund things going forward, these are going to be big challenges. Um, and, and indeed, how we, you know, I know that one of the things that will come through the board soon is the, the big commissioning framework for the NHS as well and for, for adults' health and social care partnership. So, those bigger things about um, the, the area, the region, and how it plans and what that means locally, they're, they're really the things that I think I'm hoping that the community boards can get their teeth into and they can really help us with. And at the heart of that, there's how people live, and what they can actually, how they live in terms of, um, you know, their kind of their their economic um, ability to live independently, and uh, succeed. And I suppose in that context, if I could put it that way, Katrina, I suppose I'm interested in um, in digital as being one of a number of solutions that we could maybe work on together. Is that that roughly cover what you were hoping? I would say. It does indeed. Thanks very much, Derek. Um, second question from Mark then was about in-person engagement. So Jennifer, you, you'd mentioned um, when you were doing the, the driving digital locally update about being um, getting in touch with that group. But but you're also here, I guess, as the representative of, of what we're going to be doing with the community boards going forward. Um, and I believe we we are looking to try and start bringing in some some hybrid meetings for people who can't join um, digitally. Is there anything you would want to add there to give people, um, I guess, some information around in-person engagement that we might be taking forward as well? Yeah, thanks, Katrina. So each of the nine community boards has its own local outcome improvement plan, and our colleagues in the communities team who are on the call tonight are working directly with local community and voluntary organisations around what does digital inclusion mean for you? So in areas like Shots or Och and Loch, it might actually be about access to broadband. It might be about the connectivity. In areas like Motherwell or Bells Hill, it might be more about training in new digital technologies. In other areas, it might be about people not having access to a laptop or a device. So through the driving digital locally mapping exercise that I described, we are trying to pin down what are the specific issues around digital in each local area. And with our colleagues in community learning and development and the communities team and the voluntary sector, because there's some very good work being done by Van L, for example, and Glen Boyg Neighbourhood House around providing training for local people in using digital technology. So 
absolutely, yes, there is an intention to engage with people face to face. When we organised tonight's session, we were mindful that we were doing this via WebEx. We were doing this session remotely. But in doing this session remotely, we have allowed people to come to this meeting from the comfort of our own living rooms. You know, we haven't required people to get in a bus and traipse to Motherwell Concert Hall. And I would ask people who are on the call tonight, take what you've heard, cascade it amongst your own family, your own community organisations and your friends, pass on the information. And just one final thing, where we can, Derek mentioned the savings and the, the financial challenges that lie ahead, but where we can, we will utilise and apply for every penny of external funding that's available through the Connect in Scotland programme or through the Flexible um, Digital Fund to get devices and to pass these out to families who are really struggling um, so that they're not excluded through not being able to afford to buy their own device. Thanks for that, Jennifer. If I can take the questions from Colin McIntyre and Richard Sullivan together, because both of them are largely asking for a little bit more information around the roadmap and the timelines. I'm assuming from, from both of you, you're, you're specifically focusing the diagrams that we put up about the maps and the coverage. So um, obviously we're working those, those timelines up in detail. But if I can hand that to Grant first and then Bruce, if you can just give a little bit more information to the meeting around those timescales that we're hoping to work to. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Katrina. So our, our current area of focus is, is kind of in the Motherwell area. Uh, and we are looking to bring 10 of our corporate sites on by the end of July. Uh, we then have the ambition of having about another 100 on by the end of September. We've actually got all the sites hopefully to come across by the end of June next year. This is a really, really aggressive program. Uh, but you know, as Bruce says, 40 kilometres of fibre in the ground already. Uh, if you extrapolate that out, you know what we're actually ahead of the game for this. So that it is looking good. We actually need to sit down and have a wee bit more of a talk with Comms World about you know what is the next areas that we that we want to tackle. They'll have their thoughts about what best suits them. We'll maybe have some thoughts for ourselves, and maybe that is some community input that might be useful to us as well. So Mullow was the area that we wanted to pick up first, and I won't bore you with the reasons for that. But you know the locations of primary data centres and such like is, is a, a main focus for us in there. Uh, so that that's the kind of key bit, and we we'll, we will deal with Bruce and look to get any kind of engagement we get from MD that helps us identify something that is sensible to to go and do. Bruce will be I don't know Bruce, how many teams do you have working in the area? Actually, just now um, only one but, one but, gang of guys driving about in a van. There's quite a few. No, there, there's there's at least um, six teams with Net Omnia, and we've got four out. So there's about ten teams out there just now actually doing that from test rodding and roping through to installing infrastructure and then blowing fibre behind them. So it's a it's a tried and tested methodology. Um, but but what what will happen is you you don't want all of those teams in the same location. So we will start to move out into the more rural areas because you start to get congested. Um, you know, and to keep the overall program on track. So one question specifically is about one of the rural areas. Um, the core network infrastructure um, will be heading out past Caldercrux and along the, the the road in that general direction. So it's not far from there. That will be in play by um, mid next year, summer next year. Um, and at that point, the, it, it talks about um, privately owned homes and the, the particular question. That's when we start to look at, is the voucher scheme an opportunity to use that? And can we connect those properties using the voucher scheme? So no, to answer the question, you don't need to wait until 2026. These conversations will be live and active uh, running out through through next year on that specific question. Katrina, would it be okay if I just touched on the previous question? Just a wee bit. I wanted just to add a wee bit in in terms of we have a you know a really successful and well used public access computing uh, service. Uh, we've got two colleagues on tonight. You know David Young from Kinetic Learning and Development and, and Russell Brown from Libraries, uh, and we have a, a large presence of public access computing. 
and we want to enhance that and, and look at how we deliver that in, in the future. So it's just to you know point that out that you know it's there, it is well used, uh, and that provides that you know a free free point of use for people who don't have their own device direct access to a device to get online. Thanks very much, Grant. I was going to bring you in to answer the question from from Dennis O'Keefe um, around that public access computing. So, so hopefully that provides some comfort there that there is scope for for, for community groups to to be able to, to access um, the Wi-Fi NLC venues. Although I'm appreciating that um, that we do obviously take group bookings and community facilities etc. And, and that's not intended to be a replacement for that. Um, but um, Russell, if you've got anything you want to add, you could just drop it onto the chat. So that takes me to the question from Adrian Waddle, which is specifically around legal consents, planning conditions, probably the root pack grant. So can I bring you in to answer Adrian's question? And again, supported by Bruce, if there's anything that you specifically want to cover off there. Thanks. Okay. So I mean, this one's obviously quite specific into kind of. Uh, 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 flats and such like, which I'm not as, as familiar with, and Bruce will have a better answer than I will. But I'll give you the kind of answer that, that we have for the, the corporate environment. Uh, you know, every premise that is done, uh, uh, Bruce's guys go out, they have to create a, what we call a root pack. So that's actually a photographed uh, uh, plan of how they're going to actually install this, with schematics that show how we're going to go and do it. That gets presented back to us. We then look at it, our corporate property look at it. Uh, it gets looked at by uh, uh, land ownership just to make sure whether we're crossing over in terms of any way leaves that might have to put in place, who owns the land, etc. Uh, and that all gets signed off before an install even starts. Once that install starts, again, the, the guys have to take pictures of the install that they're doing so that we can see what has happened, uh, as an example, one of the reasons that we do that is things like going through a, a, maybe a, a fire stop. So we want them to make sure, you know, is the fire stop solid before they went through? Once they put the cable through, have they repaired that and put it back in? So we maintain the health and safety uh, aspects associated with any building. And all of that is then kept as part of a record of the work that's been done for this. Into, uh, you know, residential blocks of flats and such like, that's maybe a bit more interesting question. I, I think mixed tenure resident areas, that's probably a bit more unique for me. We probably need somebody from legal to answer that. Uh, I don't know if you've got a, a thought on it, Bruce, but certainly where there were council properties, we would be able to do that. And I would expect in the mixed tenure areas, the council would still retain rights to common stairwells and, and risers and such like that would allow us to work through, which would probably help in a good way. But Bruce, anything you want to add? Yeah, so so in existing multi dwelling units that that type of approach, then um you would you would expect to have the local authority have permission in the common areas, so, so risers and so on. Um, you know, we would terminate the fibre somewhere somewhere on uh, in, in the ground floor, and then we would use internal internal fibre to get to the the various different properties, and then connect them. And it's very very small small fibre count. Um, but the point in here about um, new build, um, whether it be um, residential or whether it be council, we've already engaged with um, North Lanarkshire Department so that we are having the conversations. So even at a simple level, putting in subduct um, at the time of build and making sure that the infrastructure is there from day one, um, and then also looking about how that can then connect into the property. So we're having these conversations now, and we have got visibility of the forward build plan, which actually helps us to plan in advance. So, you know, um, in mixed dwelling units, we're not doing too much of that at this point in North Lanarkshire, but I would expect that to come over time. But we have got experience of doing that. But it is, it's about getting access to the common area and then using small fibre to connect into each of the properties and then putting some form of uh, router on the end of that. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks again. So, Bruce, some very specific questions then from Bill Craig and from Camille Tomzik around wooden poles, um, cables, et cetera. If I can just um, um, pass those to you to respond as best as you can, please. Yeah, so um, we, we don't tend to use pole access. So when we're talking about um, using PIA, PIA can be using existing infrastructure in the ground. 
Um, but for that final connection, you can also use, um, you can connect a fibre from the pole into the home. And, and that's heavily utilised in, in England. Um, but, but comms world at this stage, we would not be planning to use pole access unless we could not dig fibre to that. Because typically with pole access, you'll have one pole which is fed by a fibre and then it's daisy chained off that. Um, which introduces um, potential single points of failure. So, so we don't tend to use that. So um, un unless we have to, we will tend to build out um, from our network directly into each of the properties. And the way that happens is um, we we um, go to the front of the property or the rear of the property, which is e easier access and put a small Toby box, which is a small, small chamber that we should put outside each property. And then when service is required, we would actually deliver that into the home. Um, as for open reach replacing replacing poles, I think under um, the terms of their license, are pretty much allowed to do that. Um, regardless, um, I'm not I'm not an expert on open reach infrastructure. Um, we we use it, but actually, pole, poles are problematic from a from an ISP perspective because you need to potentially go through agreement from whoever's garden it's in, and then actually. Over time, you start to see more and more um, infrastructure added to that pole. So I think it introduces more risk. So it's not our preferred methodology to do that. OK, thank you again. So running down the ones that we've covered off as we've been going and um, the response from Matt as well about the engagement model, etc. So next question then uh, from Dan O'Keefe around um, ongoing training and um, how we plan to achieve that. So I'll I'll pick up on that initially, and then if there's anything you want to add, Jennifer, um, even Russell, then that that would would be helpful. So when Jennifer was talking about the driving digital locally subgroup, one of the first things that the, the group started to try and look at was identifying where there is digital support, digital training already in place, um, across all of the community board areas. Um, as we've been attending community boards previously and, and talking about um, how we tackle digital inclusion, where it's been included on the local outcome improvement plan, it, it, it became apparent that, that, that there are um, volunteer sections, third party organisations already in place, community groups who, who are doing that anyway. So what we've been trying to do so far is, is to identify what exists and, and how that can be best used through the community boards to try and um, help um, improve um, digital inclusion, as I say, um, digital activity. But it's been very challenging to do that mapping activity. Um, so it, at the moment, it is, it is quite tricky to understand where there may be gaps. So if I can just um, say what I said earlier and piggybacking on the comment that Derek made, these are some of the areas that we really are looking for the, the community board reps to come to the fore and actually start to try to help identify what exists, what still needs to be done, and how can we collectively as, as boards and organisations help to take that forward. Um, the, the council's got various strategies, as well the other partner organisations, on how it actually starts to move forward and improving on that digital inclusion. Um, and again, I think Yvonne mentioned possibly Grant actually, as we were running through the presentation, um, that, that you know we are working on developing a digital inclusion and skills plan. So there's plenty of opportunities um, through the community boards and your organisations to feed into that. So that the, the, the people who are on that group, Grant mentioned some of them already, and David Jung, Russell Brown, Yvonne Weir, we've got several people already there actually actively trying to take that forward. So I guess we just need more um, um, activity and more details coming from um, the, your organisations to help to make sure that we target that as, as where it's really needed at that additional intensive. So hopefully that picks up on that point. Um, the next one then, next question um, from Margaret Greer, um, plans marketing and comms to engage with key stakeholders. Um, around notice boards, et cetera. So, so Matt's already covered off, you know, that there is an engagement model and, and through Matt and Leanne and their team, um, then they will absolutely be looking to identify the best ways of, of engaging with, with the, all of our, our residents and businesses. So hopefully that picks up on that point. Um, anything else? Russell's put a comment on the chat. Um, thank you, Russell, uh, as requested around public access computing. Um, and I'm now catching up with the questions. So these are ones that I haven't seen yet. 
Um, so 7.37, um, Adrian uh, Waddell, um, any question there, permission of the owners, um, it's not easy. Okay, um, that's more a comment than a question. Um, I think that's us. And final question then um, that I have at the moment, uh, Roberta Hutton, um, doing a broadband for our use, will there be financial assistance to get broadband laid into our premises? So who's wanting to pick up on that? Jennifer again mentioned that we do try to work with organisations um, to, to help them um, to, to attract funding um, and you come grant. So that's where the voucher scheme should come into play there. Uh, you know, I, I, it depends where the building is and, and what it's look, uh, how it's located. But if, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's sitting, for instance, uh, a bit of a way from uh, any other places. That, that there's vouchers that you can apply for up to five thousand pounds, and it, a lot of this maybe isn't well known, despite Scottish government and organisations like ourselves, you know, trying to publicise that. Uh, there's a real struggle with with actually getting uptake on it. So part of the the process that we want to do here is 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 look to, to make sure we get that good community engagement and Comms World will look to kind of almost lead in that as as our kind of partner for that to engage with the communities and say how can we create that aggregated demand for vouchers. So if there's two or three or four properties round about that church and they are all interested in getting broadband themselves. Then that money's doubling up, so you're ending up at twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand that we can start to claim, and that actually starts to make it much, much more capable of being done. So, through the engagement with Comms World, through the engagement of, uh, with some of their partners, looking at the voucher schemes, and I've got some specialist companies in there working with them who really look at rural properties. That's what we'll be trying to do to see how we would look to feed them things through. Any additional comment, Chris? Uh, no, ex exactly that. Um, Carol Ann actually is our is our internal expert on the voucher scheme. She's got the scars from it, um, but um, but we've got we've got a lot of experience now for doing that internally. We've we started to do that across Renfrewshire, um, but we'll, we but we're now understanding how the process and how we gain access to the money. So between us and our partners, um, that's exactly the type of conversation is gaining access to those vouchers. Thank you. So I've been allocating questions as they've been coming in to the person I felt was most appropriate to respond. But is, is anyone on the panel wishing to come in and add any further information to any of the questions that we've covered off so far? Katrina. And you come, Derek. Yeah, I just think um, one of the things I would say, um, and various people have, have, um, have alluded to it, during the pandemic, at high speed, we did a number of things in the digital environment um, that were quite incredible very quickly. So, for example, moving free school meal um, payments to digital over the course of a month from a stand and start using uh, text messaging systems would have probably taken us six months to a year to do a project like that. We did it in a month at the start of the pandemic. Um, releasing over 8,000 8, devices to um, families and through through different channels, through the adult Connect in Scotland what, uh, funding streams and also through the ones that came uh, to education. And, you know, we've had 700, 750,000 visitors to our virtual school um, through the pandemic and beyond, and we're, we're hoping to hit a million as we go through this next academic session. These are massive, massive things that we've done in order to kind of um, transform how we're delivering under that major pressure of the pandemic. So I think probably one of the things we're trying to do is to keep that spirit of radical um, change and, you know, that kind of pace around development as part of this model. It's almost like this model is kind of like building on all those great kind of incubated successes and that, you know, that kind of um, spirit and that kind of um, you know, ambition that we had um, to 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 move quickly and with purpose during the pandemic. So I, I think I'd probably just throw those numbers in, Katrina, because they probably illustrate some of our current achievements and some of the uniqueness of what we're trying to build in North Lanarkshire. Thanks for that, Derek. I think that that's fair and appropriate and provides that extra bit of context, Yvonne. 
Um, thank you, Katrina. I just wanted to come in and talk about the business community as well. We've spoken a lot about residents, but you know, the business community can really take advantage of this and you know, enhanced fibre connectivity as well. So a big part of working with Comms World and in particular my own team in the council will be how we get that information out to our businesses, out to our business parks to make sure they can take advantage of the, the improved connectivity. And that also um, links in with you know how we can support you know digital technology advances and also links very much into the digital skills agenda, you know, how we can help business skills to improve and upskill people who are actually in the workplace. So when you were talking about um, digital skills earlier, a big part of that will be working to improve digital skills. I think on one of the slides, we did a survey last year and 67% of local businesses, you know, advised us they had a digital skills gap. So in order, you know, for our businesses to continue to grow and employ people, we really need to tackle um, some of the workplace digital skills as well. And that will be a key element of what we're doing moving forward. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Yvonne. So, are there any final questions from anyone? We have got um, just over 10 minutes left um, for, for a couple of final questions, if there are any. Meanwhile, I'll just carry on talking. So, Oh, there's one just come in. Final question then. Certainly there's not going to be an issue with installation. So another technical question, um, I guess, Grant or Bruce, you want to pick up on Camille's last question? Uh, yeah, um, so fl flooding, um, so, so fibre by its very nature, um, is is okay underwater because you can imagine it's underground ground quite a lot. It's, it's when it's the electronics it's an issue. Um, so so we don't we don't tend to have many major concerns with um, with fibre um, in in and around water. Obviously not. You, you don't want it underwater for a long period of time. And typically when we open a chamber, we will pump out water from from that chamber because you you do get that after after certain weather conditions. So so that doesn't tend to cause us any issues. And actually, quite interestingly, we're working on a project outside of North Lanarkshire about putting fibre in fresh water um, to actually connect more rural areas. So so that that gives you an idea that you can actually run that fibre in that type of environment. So um, it's, 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 it's passive infrastructure. Um, the time water becomes a problem is when it's electronics, um, and that tends to be in exchanges rather than being in the ground. Thank you, Bruce. So I'm just going to get ready to close the meeting down now. Um, thank you very much to, to everyone who has um, submitted a question. Um, we, we certainly have had a good range there, and, and hopefully um, you, you've had um, sufficient responses to all of your questions. Um, and again, thank you to the panel for presenting and for um, uh, responding to the questions that have come in. Um, as we said at the outset, um, we're really keen that you share um, the information with, with your representatives and with as, as many people as, as possible, just to start to get that excitement building for what is a, a really exciting and necessary development um, uh, throughout North Lanarkshire. Um, we will share a, a PDF of the presentation, um, and I think um, we'll also share um, an anonymised version of the types of questions and the responses that, that we have given, which again might provide good context if you're having dialogue um, in, in, in your own groups. But um, other than that, again, as I say, just um, thanks to everyone for, for attending and, and for your contributions. Um, and um, we will see you all again at um, future uh, community engagement events. And thanks again, Matt, for facilitating and organising the live streams. Very much appreciated. Take care, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you.